Blessed be, Ellie. Oh, blessed be, Brian. How are you? Good. You ready for your interview? I am so excited about my coven. interview. I am in so excited. All right. First question. Tell us something about yourself and how you came to live in New Orleans. Okay. I'm a Southerner. I was born in Florida. I grew up in Northwest Florida, spent most of my life there, Fort Walton Beach, Navarre, Destin, Pensacola. So my family always brought us to New Orleans for cultural events, uh, museum events, going to see music, going to theater or, or classical music, going out to dinner. And in 1970, when I was a little tiny girl, I came here at my first time and I said, I will be moving back to this city. So I moved here when I was 49 years old. I'm an artist and I, make, uh, I work here as an artist, which is a great city for me. And I've stayed in Florida, but I've lived here for four years and it's my true home. And why did you join the New Orleans Coven? I think really, to be honest, it's for fellowship. I like to, I work alone a lot in my life at, in various systems of occult work and have worked in groups and tried many kinds of groups as a guest to see where I fit in or who I could resonate with. I've always loved old, what I consider to be old, traditional British and European witchcraft. Gardnerian and Alexandrian witchcraft in my mind are the foundation of, of coven witchcraft in the modern day and I love the energy and the people. I wanted to be able to work with people who were very high quality, very committed to the work in the circle, in the ritual space and uh, practice so that power could be built up in different ways and practiced in different ways. And then the, the fellowship is fabulous. That's why I joined the New Orleans Coven. It's, it's for the people and the practice together is fabulous. And you hinted on this a little bit, but could you tell us something about your magical uh, background before you joined the Coven? Yeah. Well, I the, love you, but no. the, uh, <laughs> I know, these, our dogs are all over the The dogs all, always want, the homes. cameras come. I know. All of our dogs are hands. That's, that's, why, the that's why our Coven's great too, because we all have our special pets. Um, my story is pretty classic. I was born with really strong uh, visual and auditory psychism. My mother's family, the women on her side, were known to be good seers and healers. So it was just, you know, part of the genetics to be born with that. It was so strong that it caused me to have really early interests in the esoteric, in um, divination, in, in working with the dead. Um, the God forms, I started studying mythology as a little kid. And most of my interests outside of my regular schooling were esoteric and occult subjects. So I ended up getting a philosophy degree and a, and a minor in comparative relig religion. I have a minor in history. And then I have worked with a lot of different practical systems in the occult. Astrology, palm reading, tarot, herbalism, herbal gardening, um, ritual magic, thergy, ceremonial magic. I worked with Servants of the Light for 10 years. They are a school that's a hermetic school, an offshoot of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn through the teaching of Dion Fortune and Walter Ernest Butler. So that's a very rigorous and difficult uh, intellectual program, working her hermetic philosophy and Kabbalistic philosophy. I worked with the group in Atlanta doing quite a bit of ritual training in a temple I've worked with a shaman, an American Indian shaman healer. I've taken several trips to England and Scotland to work with uh, people sometimes I didn't know, but I had some, through the grapevine, ability to make friends with some people and say, could I please come do that with you? And, um, and then today... Uh, working in New Orleans. I'm a famous psychic. I know we're not supposed to say that, but I'm a famous psychic and I work. You are a famous psychic. And I see thousands of people. And a famous painter. I'm a fam and I'm a famous painter, but I'm a famous psychic. And I see thousands of people and work with people from all kinds of, of backgrounds and esoteric and occult and magical work and, and alternate religion. It's just fabulous. I just love it and all combined and uh, all these years of study and reading and traveling and working. Um, 
this is the best. This is the best it's ever been in my life. I love it. So following up a great question is, what does being Alexandrian mean to you? Alexandrian witchcraft has an art to it. It has a certain beat and flavor. It's very elegant. The liturgy and the spoken words are poetry. In my experience, the groups are uh, devoted to the work and bring real elegance and dedication into temple, into practice. It's fertility-based, it's nature-based, it's a very positive and life-affirming religion. It is a religion. It offers everything that a good religious service should offer. It has a, a hierarchy so that priesthood has been trained and has practiced and studied for years before they're in a position of priesthood. And there's a line of integrity that can be tracked and discussed so that when you enter Alexandrian craft, you know what you're getting into and you know who's there before you. It's a fabulous system if you, if you want more structure and accountability in witchcraft. And it's old and cool. It's old and cool. Uh, can you share with us a personal magical success story? Hmm. Well, I am snobby and I believe the proof is in the pudding. And I think people that are happy with who they are and their lives, what they have created for themselves, they are self-actualized, they are authentic, they are individuated, and then really have manifested what they want to become as a human and what they want to do on the, on the earth. And they're doing it. Then that's the highest magic, I think. It's a combination of thurgy and thaumaturgy. It's practical. I need to make money, but I also and I need to heal my cut finger. But I also want to ascend the ladder on the tree of life and grow my humanness. So my best magic is all of that. It's my whole life, and um, I've been doing magic spells for 35 years, and I think there's a cum an accumulated benefit that's great. Great. All right. Who are your top three goddesses, and why? Oh, well, my mother's name is Diana, so I have to choose that. Hecate is one of my tops because she came to me so early in my life, and she, she was a companion for me in the frightening times of my psychic childhood. And she did appear with a black dog and with uh, a, 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 a lot of motion to the head, which could be interpreted as the three heads, but she could see all the way around like an owl and she had a big dog with her. So Hecate and Diana. So my third favorite goddess is the oldest one, my childhood one, is the Venus of Wellendorf, the oldest little stone carvings with the great breasts and the butt and the stomach and the head that looks like a phallus. I right. love that, and that's just that stone that was made in the hand. That's the image of, of, of mother. That is um, my deepest instinct towards goddess. Um, who is your favorite witchcraft elder and why? I don't know. I guess I'm going to say Gerald Gardner, just because I love his style and his weird hair and <laughs> his goofy voice, but... I just think he was such an odd bird, but he re really took somebody like that to bring witchcraft, old and and new, out into the world like he did. It was a real special moment, and he just really stands out. I see the silhouette of his hair against a black background as he's talking with his chin wobbling and really making it real. Right. What advice would you give a person just beginning to explore traditional craft? Well, I read an awful lot of I read an awful lot of English, Irish, and Scottish history. Its birthplace is there, and if if you can hear about, if you can begin to put into your mind the Stone Age in England, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, what who was there, what tribes were there, who was worshipped, what were the politics, you can you can really frame up where the gods come from in England, what their histories are, their locations, 
and, and really begin to build up your own inner plane of, of the British Isles because you've got to be able to do that for British craft. You've got to, and you've got to go there. So yeah, book some tickets. <laughs> I agree. Right. Um, in regards to the craft, describe a pet peeve of yours. Mm. Well, I'm guilty of this a lot. I think it's probably a good projection. I find myself commenting on other people or what other people think or do when I don't know because I haven't been there or seen it from my own eyes. And uh, I think we're drawn into a lot of commentary online and um, on podcasts and even television shows to comment about the other occultist in the world. I think we should stop doing it and make our own work full of lots more content our own studies and our own practice, and all devote ourselves a little bit more to the work. Uh, many members of the New Orleans Coven are very public about the craft. Do you think this is necessary these days, or should witches be more secretive and private? Well, I've got two really different answers about that. I'm very secretive and private. I think witchcraft is exciting because not everyone can do it. It's secretive and private, and when you're in a witchcraft coven, there's a special there's a special thread of power there that's just, it's undefinable. But when everybody knows about it and everybody's talking about it, it loses that power. But that's my first idea. My second idea is if traditional lineaged witchcraft paths or any other druid path, shaman path, uh, are not passed on, then they do die out because they are a lineage tradition. You don't pick that thread up. I mean, you can you could do it on the astral. You could pick the thread up in a hundred years. But if all Alexandrian witches are dead, you can't get the um, the in person training that we're known for. So I I can't. I believe in it enough that I want to keep it alive. It's a great tradition and it shouldn't be lost. Neither should Gardnerian. They really need to be kept up, and they need to be practiced uh, correctly according to their philosophy and system, and then passed on correctly, because I think it's important for the modern world to have access to it. Do you have any parting words for the people of YouTube and Facebook? Hello, YouTube and Facebook. I have some great stuff on YouTube myself, and I'm on Facebook chatting it up some days. Please don't get your content there. Please go to the library and have 5,000 books and read and compare and use your brain uh, with great common sense. And work hard on your studies and quit paying attention to what other people say. Read and practice yourself and all will become evident. All right. Thank you, Ellie. Blessed be. Blessed be, Brian. Thank you.